Good morning, everyone. Wow. Everyone's had busy weeks. How many went to the beach this week? No beach visitors? Wow. We're Islanders? What's going on? Oh, there we go. Yes, yes. Party in the corner. All right, why don't we take a few moments and welcome someone to church this morning. Let's, let's greet each other. All right, we're going to get started here. It's exciting to listen to you all talk. I wasn't close enough to get the gossip, but I guess that's okay. Um, There's a lot to go through, actually, this morning, so I wanted to get a a quick head start on the announcements. There's a lot to share, and a lot of it's good. Um, But I do want to start with the obvious one that Pastor Jeff is not doing announcements this morning. 
Um, many of you know, if you're on social media or you're connected uh, that way, that Pastor Jeff is ill. He is not here. Um, so he, he was getting sick for quite a while, actually, um, feeling a bit run down. And, and uh, in wisdom, he went to get checked out and went to the hospital. So Mel took him down. And it turns out he's got a, a whole list of ailments uh, to deal with. So um, Pastor Jeff actually has to get his gallbladder removed. And uh, I asked permission to speak about the details, just in case you wonder if I'm being gory. Um, Pastor Jeff has lived his life with chronic illness in the past, but um, so he, he has to get his gallbladder removed, so he's waiting for surgery. Potentially today it'll happen. Um, so he's without food, and when he texted me this morning, he would really appreciate you know, getting back in routine. Um, but he also has mono. Um, and if you know anything about mono, that could be a few weeks and it could be a few months of leth lethargy, lethargy, how do you say that? <laughs> lethargy. <laughs> haven't used that word much. Um, so be in prayer for him. Uh, he's likely watching if he has Wi-Fi, so uh, make sure you greet him. I'm not entirely sure about visitation at this point because... Um, he still has a procedure to go through, but we'll keep you posted on Facebook. If you don't have Facebook, um, you know somebody with Facebook. If you're a grandparent, I'm sure your grandchildren can point you in the right direction. <laughs> and um, that right now is the easiest way to communicate on a regular basis. Um, he's in good spirits. He's fine. There's nothing major he's being taken care of, but I just want you to know um, that that does disrupt the flow. So if you see me up here a bit more, you know why. Um, so, but we'll keep you posted on Pastor Jeff, all right? So that's the latest on Pastor Jeff. Um, and pray for Mel and the kids, too. Um, there was a birthday party that was planned and things that were supposed to happen. And that does take a toll on family when illness happens. So, um, because Esther just turned 16. So it was a, it was a busy weekend for them. Um, pray for Mel, you know, working full-time and managing four kids at home in the summer as well. Um, so I know that people have stepped up, and we, they appreciate that. And uh, I'll let you know if there is some specific needs that, that can be addressed, and we'll try to communicate that as well. All right, and also tonight, don't forget, there's a wedding shower for uh, Jesse McDougal and Chloe, and um, we need to bring some finger foods. So uh, make sure that you avail yourself to that, um, open invite. And if you can be of help after the service, we need chairs and tables brought up. Um, that's a huge help. Because uh, we don't need, you know, two or three ladies that are trying to coordinate food also having to move tables and chairs. So if we can do that, it would probably take 10 to 15 minutes after service, and that would be awesome. Um, also, congratulations. If you look in the bulletin, on the inside of the bulletin, there's a congratulations to Misty and Matthew Spouter on the arrival of their baby girl, Adeline Anna. Um, I'm glad all the details are here. Guys aren't good at that stuff. So it's all written here for you. <laughs> Um, and also congrats to John and Holly Barrett on their new baby girl, 8 pounds, 10 ounces. I did get that detail, born on the 12th, and baby and mom are great. Um, that was shared publicly on Facebook, FYI. And I don't believe there's a name as of yet, so I think suggestions are welcome. <laughs> I don't know. You can let them know. All right, and one more I wanted to share um, is I got an email through Mike Arthurs from the Willis family, a lot of you know the Willis family, they're currently traveling, they're doing missions. And we got an interesting email and I thought it's easier to read it than to try to paraphrase it because I'm not funny and he is. <laughs> so everything's fine, but I wanna read it and then you get the idea of, of what's going on there. He said, I wanted to send a quick update. We just drove 1800 kilometers from Kandern, Germany through Switzerland, Austria, Hungary and finally arrived in Romania late last night. The drive down was good until we got to Romania where we saw four different accidents. Speed limits and passing safely are not a high priority here. We were traveling with the missionary's daughter um, where al almost to the mission site when she had an, an anaphylactic reaction. We rushed to the nearest hospital but couldn't find it. It was dark and nothing was marked very clearly. No H signs like we have back home here. We asked a local where the hospital was, but when we, he was verbally telling us to turn left, but pointing for us to turn right, we knew we were in trouble. The little girl was struggling to breathe by this time. We did not know how we would find the hospital, but God did. We saw the police and asked them for a police escort to the hospital. Wow, was that crazy. I was driving a six-speed diesel van through little Romanian city like a one-armed bank robber, except... <laughs> 
except I was chasing them. <laughs> I have to admit it was terribly fun. If you know him with that one arm, and you've ever seen him on a snowmobile, you know it would have been interesting. The good news is the little girl made it, and we are so thankful. We, are, we officially start working on the site this coming Monday. We will be helping to build a multi-purpose community building and a small building to house the furnace at the missionary's home. Attached are a few pictures of our ride in Romania, and they posted beautiful pictures. Anyways, I just thought I'd share that with you because in all of the trouble, it's amazing to see how, how God can work, and I would love it if they had videotaped that. <laughs> Maybe they'll make a short video for us. Um, I think that's all the announcements. So why don't we have the ushers? Um, I think we're a little short staff right now. So uh, um, we want to take up our morning tithes and offerings. And again, this is a time of worship for us. Um, giving back to the Lord is, is worship. And uh, we don't take that lightly. Um, but we do want to honor God with our finances. So let's pray together. Lord, thank you for the blessing of church. Thank you for community. Thank you for family. And thank you that we can share openly our struggles and share our concerns and also share the many blessings that are happening here at the church. And Lord, I pray for Pastor Jeff. I pray for his health. I pray for a speedy recovery. And um, I thank you that he can trust in you and that you have everything under control and that you've put people and circumstances and the church in place to help each other and to serve together because ultimately we're all here to serve you so i thank you for that i pray for a speedy recovery for him i do pray for the willis family as they travel um, hopefully they um, have more unique but maybe not so dangerous experiences <laughs> and uh, help them to come back to us with um, some more awesome updates and i thank you for the blessing of children i thank you for those that have been born and uh, that you keep increasing the population it seems at our church but may um, all these children and the families want to dedicate them to the Lord and that as we grow as a church family, we're also growing in the word. Uh, so as we look to even the future, even as uh, Jesse and Chloe are looking to their future, we pray for them. We pray for wisdom. We pray for um, the nurturing and the love that grows between two people. And that's a huge um, picture of your love for us, um, that we are bound to you and that uh, we are your bride. So, Lord, thank you so much for all that you do, and help us as we give back just a, a portion of the many blessings you've given to us. Help us to do that cheerfully and faithfully, and do it because we love you. In your name, amen. All right, as we start this morning, Beth's going to um, read our call to worship. And then we're actually going to do a song I'm sure that most of you have heard, but I don't know if we've actually done it in church. It's called The Lion and the Lamb. Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. All right, as you can, uh, if you could stand with us, we're going to sing together.
The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. We're going to sing, Who You Say I Am. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me into his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Through the sunset's free, oh, his free.
Tracy, would you mind reading scripture for us? I'm reading from Psalm 25, verses 8 to 14. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Who is the man who fears the Lord? Him will he instruct in the way that he should choose. His soul shall abide in well-being, and his offspring shall inherit the land. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he makes known to them his covenant. All right, we're going to sing Blessed Assurance, but in 4-4 time. And that might make sense to some of you, but you'll catch on. Are you ready? I'm just going to start it. Are you ready? Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a This is my story, this is my song, praising my
Let's keep singing. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness. New every morn. Our sins, they are many. One more song before Pastor Dan comes up to preach. <laughs> so pardon my drinking water in between. The, the hardest part about being a worship leader is trying to be smooth and you can't do three things at once. So I think you guys understand because we're all worship leading. We're all part of the family. So if we, this was in our living room, I would expect you to do as much as I'm doing here. So, and you are. And I'm so thankful for that. And it's amazing the theology that we get to sing as we do this. I don't know if you've been paying attention, but we try to look at the lyrics when we sing these songs. And I encourage you, even if you can't do it now, because you sing emotionally, look back later, watch the live stream again, and re-sing it at home. Because sometimes you can glaze over some pretty amazing wording, and it's all from Scripture. Um, these songwriters, it's not about them. I don't really, like, I appreciate Jason Ingram, but, you know, this, he's doing this because he wants to worship God, and that's why we sing these songs together. So my encouragement to you is to focus on who you're singing to and not just the song. Amen? Amen. 
God over all, and that we get this time to focus on you. Thank you that we can do this freely. Thank you that we're not currently under persecution, um, but Lord, protect us and keep us. Help us to be bold in our faith, and thank you that we can do this together. Um, and I pray as we enter into a time of the message now that you'll open our hearts and our minds to what it is that you want to say to all of us this morning in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Pardon me as I just drink some water. <clears throat> if you'd open your Bibles to the book of Colossians, that'll give me a few moments to collect my voice. 
And uh, we're actually right at the beginning of the book of Colossians. Pastor Jeff started the book last week uh, with greetings and celebration. And I get the blessing of sharing a prayer. I mean, this is the easiest, no, it's not the easiest sermon in the world. <laughs> Who am I kidding? But what better thing to communicate to you than a prayer, especially a prayer of Paul and the boldness of Paul, the love of Paul, the care of Paul, and the, the boldness, really. Um, as I was preparing this, I thought how, how trite we can be about prayer and how uh, insignificant I feel with prayer. I don't know about you, but how many feel like they're rocking their prayer life? You can put your hand up if you... No, nothing? <laughs> Nobody? <laughs> the problem is, I don't think we ever can fully be to the point where we've prayed enough. But that's not the point. So my encouragement, before I even get into some of my notes and uh, we walk through the passage, it, I want to encourage you that we don't have it all together I'm a pastor, and believe me, it's a struggle. We can be as busy and, and distracted and focused as anyone else. And this is supposed to be our job. And sometimes we are just not there. So in true confession time, I feel very inadequate to be presenting this to you. But it's not my job, it's not my words that I need to convince you of what the Lord says. The Lord is doing the work by the Holy Spirit and because of Jesus Christ. So there's the gospel right there. Uh, you can, I'm pointing you to him this morning. Um, it's important to be reminded that Paul's writing a letter to a church in Colossae that he's never actually met. So he's in bondage, and he, he has sent a herald and a missionary who's actually taught them about Jesus, and there has been conversion, and these are likely a lot of uh, Gentiles. This would be converted people. So there would be Jews as well, but it would be mostly Gentiles. And um, Paul is uh, Epaphras, I think is, is how it's pronounced. I, I always called him Epaphras. It's short form for Epaphrodites, not the same one we've, we've learned from other books. Um, but Epaphras in high esteem uh, and a faithful servant to him. So he's a herald, he's sort of a missionary, and he's, a, he's an agent of information because they didn't have email. And they didn't have Facebook, and they didn't have Twitter. They had to wait for information. And they took the, the word and the letter seriously. So that was the main information flow. So this passage also constitutes a single sentence, which is interesting. So in the Greek, it would have been a blah, 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 all the way down the page. And uh, if we were reading it up here, I would have to insert natural pauses in order to read the whole thing straight through because it would sound awkward if I was to translate directly from the Greek. And I'm not going to do that for you this morning because <laughs> I'm awkward enough without having to do that. But he's writing in response to what he's heard. So he hasn't been there, remember that. Uh, he's writing in response to what he's heard and sending back a letter in response. So this is a letter back to the church, people that he's never met. And we call that, and this is because this part is the prayer, we call that intercession. So intercession, I didn't look up the dictionary definition of it, but it's safe to say that it means to pray for somebody who's not immediately in front of you. So to intercede on behalf of something or someone means it could be anywhere. So he is interceding, and it's being written because he wants them to know that they're, he's praying for them. And he's mostly, most likely wrote the letters to Ephesus, Philippi, Colossae, and the personal letter to Philemon around the same time. I don't know, it's not important here about how much time he spent writing all these letters. What's important is that he's in writing mode. He's in encouragement mode, and he's in prayer mode. And I think he always was, but specifically, we get the evidence of this in the Word. So before we dive into the passage then, um, and try to dissect it a bit, the prayer, let's read the, the prayer together. Colossians 1, verses 9 to 14. And so from the day we heard... We have not, not, have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience 
with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This is the word of the Lord. That's a long sentence, isn't it? There's one period, so I got to pause. But I think it's purposeful because he's trying to keep all of this together so that they don't lose heart, that they don't miss the whole point is he is fervently, and what did he say? Ce he's ceaseless in his prayer, um, praying without ceasing. We joke about that when somebody says, will you pray? Well, I pray without ceasing, like I'm always praying um, when we talk to people. And the reality is we actually are probably the opposite. Um, but Paul means this. He's saying, this is what I'm doing. Well, he's in bondage, so he probably has a bit of time in his hands. But he's been in bondage before, and he, this is just par for the course for Paul. He expects this, so he just lives his life. He drives, you know, whoever's holding him hostage crazy because he just does ministry wherever he is. Um, and it, sometimes it seems weird to analyze a prayer because I was thinking about this as well. Would you ever sit and listen to somebody pray and just analyze them? That, that would seem like a bad thing to do. But So I feel sort of like I'm sneaking into the room as Paul's writing this down and praying. Um, but I think it is, again, intentional because that's why it's in the canon of Scripture. Uh, we can dissect this prayer. And considering this, the circumstances and his motivation, I believe it's important to learn how he prayed. And that's what I want you to take home as well. Um, <clears throat> then it's how do we apply it to ourselves. So there's key parts here. It's knowing that he prayed, how he prayed, and what it means for us and how we can pray. After all, prayer is one of the most difficult priorities for us to commit to. In our busyness culture, let's just call it busyness culture. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say we live in a selfish culture because I don't think everyone is selfish, but I think busyness exudes selfishness and we don't realize it. So I, I would prefer to call it busyness culture because we all think busyness is important. Um, and I don't doubt that to a certain extent, but I don't think our motivation is selfish. Um, but it all comes down to priorities. And I love how Paul doesn't offer up a, a trite prayer. So he's written a lot. He's talked a lot. And then he has to write something down and give to somebody to send off. So if they've been writing and scribing a lot, you would think that he would just say, okay, just tell them I'll pray for them. They'll fill in the blanks. They'll know, they'll know the rest. But Paul doesn't do that. He is very specific in wanting to know. He's actually using this as a teaching moment and a prayer. That doesn't mean it minimizes the fact that he is literally praying for them and loving them, but he's also teaching them. And you can learn through prayers. You can be taught by listening to someone else pray. So I would love to have been there when Paul was saying this and it was being scribed. Um, I just love how he's not trite about anything. <clears throat> Paul offered unceasing prayer. And I want to keep underlining that because the unceasing part sort of um, feels uncomfortable. Um, my wife and I pray when we come in and I can't close my eyes because I'm driving. So is that bad? I don't think so. I don't think the mode or it's the motivation of prayer, right? Sometimes we're like, that's the only time we're not around everybody else is we have a few moments turn the country station off, and so I'm revealing what we're listening to. Um, you can pray for us. <laughs> but a few moments of time seems like an eternity when you don't do it often, right? So two, three, four, five minutes can feel like a lot, probably because we're out of practice and we need to do it more. Um, so first, Paul shares his, great, his gratefulness for the church. So that's important to note, his gratefulness for the church. He's thankful. He's thankful for them and wants to express his love for them by sharing how faithful he is to them in praying for them. So he's praying for their faithfulness, yet he's sharing that his faithfulness to them is a commitment. So he's faithful to God, first and foremost, but because of his faith in God, he's faithful to pray for them as he's trying to encourage them in their faith with God. So this church is family to Paul. And Pastor Jeff talked about that last week. It's not blood, but spiritual family is eternal. So think about that for a second. So 
whatever you think of me, you're stuck with me for eternity. <laughs> Our siblings, on the other hand, should be the same thing. I'm, I'm kidding. But the reality is we, we don't always think or look at life in light of eternity and think, man, I should be praying for you now because I want a better version of you in eternity. <laughs> we need to encourage each other. All joking aside, though, um, the church is the church together. We are a family. So when I say, hey, brother, to a, a church member, I can actually say that and I mean it. It's not just a term we use. It means we are brothers in Christ. And it means that, again, we need to do life together. We need to not get along and figure out how to get along. We need to love each other through, through darkness. We need to encourage each other in the light. And Pastor Jeff, again, talked about that, the, the, the whole idea of we are family together through, through the good and the bad. And how are we gonna, gonna do that? We have deeper bonds than blood because of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's also been and will continue to pray for them that they will fully know God's will and know it, receive wisdom and understanding. So he's saying, I need to actually learn. So he's encouraging them to learn who taught them. The missionary who, who was heralded in that direction that stopped, started the church and encouraged them. Probably started in a home. Uh, it can happen anywhere on our island. You can start a church in a home. Um, the church is not about this. It's about us. And because of that, you can activate your faith and you can build each other up. But how do you do that? If you don't know the word, you don't know who you're praying to. And if you don't know who you're praying to, it's really hard to comprehend what he's saying to you. So we have to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. So if that doesn't make any sense to you at all and you want to know what I'm talking about, please come and ask me. And I will try to explain the gospel to you because it is simple yet profound, but it's a matter of life and death. And because of that, we have life eternal. We sang about that. So come talk to me after if you have questions. Um, but he's also wanting them to have understanding because how often do we ask for wisdom and, the hard part, are willing to wait for the answer? So we got something that we want to pray for, and it needs to happen. And then when it doesn't, what's our motivation? What's our response? Is it, well, maybe, you know, I didn't do something right. You know, we've talked about the joke where I don't wear a watch. I wore a watch for a few weeks, actually. My son bought me one just to challenge me. And it's off, and it's on, and it's off, and it's on. Not because of any weird karma thing. It's just because I don't think about it. Um, but the reality is every time I see the watch, I'm reminded of who am I trusting in? Am I trusting in what I want God to do for me? Or am I trusting in that God is going to do what he's going to do because he's faithful to me? Um, so I, I have these little triggers in my life that remind me that am I really putting my trust in the Lord? Or is it in stuff? Or is it myself? Um, so that's my own personal challenge, little reminders I have in my life. And in waiting, do we continue to pray? So if you have an ailment or a problem or you haven't sought a solution or you don't even know how to come up with a solution, do we pray for it often? Do we say, Lord, nothing's happening here, but I'm going to continue to trust you. Wisdom doesn't mean getting what we want necessarily. Wisdom is understanding or discerning God's will. And God's will and what we want are entirely different things. Sometimes we receive confirmation, and other times we receive what I'm going to call protection. Sometimes we really want something. Sometimes we are in a direction. Sometimes we want to purchase something. Sometimes we want to do something. It could be vacation, whatever it is. And we want God to affirm that for us. But he's actually given you checkpoints along the way to evaluate and sometimes we want to overlook that and over-spiritualize. I feel like sometimes I over-spiritualize things and I have to take a step back and wonder, maybe God's already told me the answer and I'm, I'm looking so deep that I'm not seeing what's right in front of me. And sometimes we can do that. So Paul wants them to have a spiritual understanding, not just simple knowledge. This only comes by the Holy Spirit and through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And he's been praying he has been praying for them that they'll have true knowledge of God and receive direction 
from God. So Paul's not necessarily telling them what to do as a church. If you read through this passage, he's encouraging them to be the church and to not be swayed by those around. Why is he praying for this? And I'll give you a whole bunch of examples really quickly of what's going on there. And this is why he's praying. Number one, the church at Colossae was under attack from false teachers. So if you meet people that walk in the door and they say, that Jesus thing you're doing, yeah, it's not real. You know that, right? Like, it's not like, don't have to listen to them. So having an infiltration of discouragement is what he's fighting against. Uh, they were denigrating or trying to reduce the deity of Jesus. They're saying, yeah, he's a good guy, but he's just one of the many Greek gods. Like, sure, we'll put him on a pedestal, but we have 15 or 50 others. So that was going on. They were teaching he was not actually God. And through Paul, or though Paul had never been to the church, um, he addressed the issues head on. So can you imagine? Paul's never been to this church, and he's acting as the authority. He's saying, no, 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 no. I'm, I need to encourage you. And he's actually doing this along the way. But even part of his prayer, in asking for wisdom and understanding and knowledge, he's encouraging them to think for themselves. And to do that, he's also asking God at the same time in his prayer to do so. But he's hitting it head on. And he reiterated the nature of Jesus Christ as creator and redeemer. And these are non-negotiables. So Paul is very clear. These are non-negotiables. So he wrote to them that he might bring wisdom to bear in the situation. I know we've used that term often, even in the business world, where we have to take a step back in light of things in the business realm or in family life and say, I think we need to apply some wisdom here. So what is wisdom in our family circumstances? What, what would be wisdom versus what is just something we can do? Um, and sometimes you have to wait for the answer. Um, it was critical to him that the church know God in his greatness and glory too. So it's not just that they're puffed up with knowledge of God. They needed to know that God is amazing and that they can trust in a holy God. And Paul had no problem diminishing the voices of the false teachers. He qualified himself at the beginning. Right at the beginning of this book, he said uh, that he confirmed his apostleship. He declared himself to be an apostle. So it's important to note that a lot of the converted believers were in fact Gentiles. I mentioned that. Uh, they would be um, also criticized by the Jews. This was known. It happened in, in the book of Philippians. Uh, the Judaizers, um, which Paul called dogs, by the way, uh, if I recall. Uh, it's been a while since I walked through the book of Philippians, but um, he was very harsh with dealing with those who were trying to tell the Gentiles to do something else in order to, to serve Jesus fully. Um, not to go back to the law. That Jesus fulfilled the law. They do not need to do that. So they were criticized. So if you have people infiltrating you and telling you in your, your brand new church and everyone's excited and worshiping and somebody comes in and says, yeah, that Jesus guy is not real. And oh, by the way, he could be real, but only if you do five things first. Um, that can be very confusing for new believers. Um, and that is not why Jesus came. And Jesus came to fulfill all of that. Um, they were judged for not following God's laws. So Paul's trying to encourage them through, their, through his prayer. Again, Jesus came to fulfill the law on their behalf. And so there's a lot to pray for here. So Paul starts with ceaseless prayer um, for them to know God's will and, and overcome these things that I just talked about. Then he shifts in the prayer to living it out. So he goes from knowledge and understanding and wisdom. I called the sermon wisdom, really, because we use one word in these, these things, and I'm running out of words, and I was trying to think of something that made sense. And the only word that jumped out at me was wisdom. Because through all of this, whether it's knowing, acting, or caring, or praying, or whatever it is, wisdom is the common denominator. And wisdom only comes from God. It is not something that I can apply to a situation. It's something I have to receive from God and then apply to a situation. So he shifts to living it out, to walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. So the next section is literally bursting. I couldn't even... Think of another way to describe it. Uh, the descriptive direction that he wants to go with this. And it says, continuing in verse 10, um, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So he's then linked the two. Now, now we're talking about the two together. There's direct connection between knowledge and applying that knowledge, which we call wisdom. So knowledge applied and then turning it into an action. So it's okay to, to know things. And it's okay to know how to apply them, but are we good at actually 
going from there. And I would submit that we struggle the most with the action part, um, me included. It's very easy to be smart about things and it's very easy to be able to comprehend it and use wisdom to understand it. But sometimes we don't necessarily know how to act on it. Sometimes we don't know who to ask to help with that. Sometimes we don't have the encouragement like a Paul in our life to say, hey, have you ever thought of, or um, I see this in your life, or I wanna pray for you for this because I see this in you and it's meant to be an encouragement. You may not see things in yourself and that's where it comes in. And then turning it into an action is if you're encouraged to go in a direction, you're free then to take action. So when we learn from God's word, that should not cause us, not cause us to take pride in knowing what it says and then sit on it. So if you have the truth and then you're satisfied, okay, I figured it out, and then what? What are we called to do as Christians when we understand, understand the truth? Go tell others, right? So Paul wants it turned into an action. So when we learn from God's word, we do not take pride in just sitting on it. God's word is living and active and should activate us to action. And again, we don't quite know how to take action sometimes because maybe we're afraid. You know, maybe we're going to be marked as a political activist because we tell people on the street that we're Christians. Um, there is now a time where that's happening. And if you follow politics at all, and I'm not here to talk about politics, but all you have to do is pay attention to the news, and you can see that compromise is all around us. And it doesn't matter what political affiliation you have. If you want voters, compromise goes hand in hand with getting votes. And there's a way that the world system works, and there's a way that God works. And it's a struggle sometimes to discern and comprehend what right and wrong is. Because even in some cases, we see what seems right, but it still feels wrong. At what point do you discern what our next step is? Again, we insert ourselves back into the fact that Paul's not just talking, he's praying. So we need to seek God's wisdom, not our own. So next, he encourages them to be strengthened with all power because now we don't know what to do with this. How do we get the power and the energy to do it? And he says, to be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. Glorious as in, he's all powerful. He created the universe. If you can't trust him to handle your situation, I don't know how big your God is. Um, of all people to pray this prayer and encourage others with it, I think Paul is uniquely qualified. I would say that's pretty, pretty certain. The supernatural power is, is like a steadfastness, similar to the example in Philippians, like I said with the false teachers. Um, his encouragement, um, he's encouraging them to hold to their teachings and positions. So if they've learned the truth, they need to hold to this, and then they need to do something about it. You need to practice it in the same way a doctor's practice, many years of practice, because you don't want to get this wrong. Do we practice our, our faith? Do we put it into practice so that it's so regular that it comes naturally? That's the kind of steadfastness I'm talking about. So, and are we seeking the right power? Is it in our own strength or is it in God's by his Holy Spirit? And the picture is sort of, I think I've used this before, but I always picture standing in the ocean with the tide coming in. And how in the world can you stand? You have to hunker down. You have to be steadfast. You have to dig in. And dig in means knowing the truth and learning the truth and then acting on the truth. But if you don't have anything, any firm ground to stand on, then you're going to be swayed in every direction. So steadfastness as a word sort of describes that. The other description would be holding your position in battle. So if you trust the commander and you see the enemy in front of you and he says, hold your position, do you run? The human heart and motivation is to run. So you have one bullet left and there's three guys and your commander says, hold your position. Do you sacrifice your life? for your commander, or do you run for cover and hide? I'm not gonna answer that for you, but if you've been trained, you know what the answer is. There's sacrifice involved. So there's sacrifice involved in your faith, there's sacrifice involved in your friendships, 
And not every word that you're going to share with your friend is going to be good. In fact, I would challenge you, if you have a friendship and you've never had an argument or you never disagreed, I would challenge your friendship. Maybe you're not true enough to each other because sometimes there's hard decisions to make and sometimes you need to trust other people. There's lots of things in my life I don't see and I'm trying to listen to other people. Of course, I listen to my wife. I listen to the Lord. I listen to my kids, believe it or not. My kids have wisdom. And I'm not just saying that because some are in the room. But oftentimes, Carrie and I, when we sit down as a family, we have a family meeting once in a while. They're older now, so we're not always together. Um, usually, truth comes out. And we realize we've gone way ahead of something or way behind something. And we have to reset. And sometimes it's our own kids that have to remind us. And sometimes your kids can be four and five and six, and God will use them to humble you or to teach you. So Paul lived this example of God's sustaining power. Paul is imprisoned, and he's still encouraging. I don't know how encouraging I would be if I was imprisoned or detained, and I would be more thinking about myself, honestly. Um, it, it would be a struggle to get outside of myself. And he was dealing with adversity often. Um, so he is, again, qualified to do this. And um, he would have been in strenuous ministry, and he would be dealing with hard times a lot. So a life pleasing to God is a life empowered by God. A life pleasing to God is a life empowered by God. Much like dealing with our culture today, where truth is being replaced, and it's crazy to think, but if you watch the news... You can see what seems like normal is not normal anymore. And we get confused because we just think something should be a certain way and then all of a sudden it's not. And we're confused because philosophy and feelings are now trumping truth. So something happens in our life and we want a, we want a better answer than truth so we, we'll turn to philosophy. Well, maybe there's a different way of thinking about this. Okay, well, what does God's word say? Oh, that's old. Like, that's like, that was for people 2,000 years ago. But no, no, no. If we hold fast to the truth, God will protect us and keep us. Um, but it's a struggle because it sounds like we're going against what would be normal, but really, what is normal in our culture? And I can't answer that question, <laughs> just so you know. We need to pray for endurance and patience, and that's the next thing. V verse 12, Paul moves into endurance and patience with joy. Patience is more literally, um, the word would be long-suffering, which doesn't sound like a nice word um, because it includes the word suffering. Um, but to have patience can be long-suffering because if you have a teenage wayward child, or you have a child that's uncontrollable, or you have a child that's, that's turned away from the Lord, or you're dealing with um, a crippling illness of some kind, like you name it, insert your issue, then think of the word patience. Do you have it? Long suffering is not easily achievable, which is why Paul always says, where does the power come from? Does it come from you or does it come from me? It, it comes from God. An example in uh, 2 Corinthians, actually, if you want to just make note of that. 2 Corinthians 6, 4 to 6, I'll read it. Um, Paul spells this out in detail. He says, But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, <laughs> sleepless nights, and hunger. Yikes. How? Verse 6. By purity knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, and genuine love. So he spells it out for us. Here's, here's what could happen, and here's what the response is. And the response is hard, but I think the afflictions would be harder. I, I would definitely want to learn patience more than I want to learn how to deal with sleepless nights and hunger. Um, but the reality is we have to face these things. So as we've already learned, the only way to accomplish this is by being strengthened in all power according to his glorious might. We said that. Now Paul wraps up his prayer and reminds them of the source of all this power and the one who's sovereign over all. 
and Jesus is the one that gives the victory. So that's the amazing part of all this, is everything can be wrapped up and summed up in the Lord Jesus Christ. But there's even more. He doesn't even stop there. This prayer goes on, and it's very purposeful, and it, it's teaching me. Every time I go the next step in this prayer, I realize, wait, there's one more thing I have to do. But the thing I have to do is the best of all. And we did it when we sang. It's thankfulness. Are we grateful to God for his blessings? Are we thankful to the Father with joy? And Paul gives three main reasons to be thankful. Very briefly, I'll just walk through them. So number one is they're qualified. So we're talking about the Colossian church again in Colossae. They are qualified to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. So Paul did not say, okay, church, you Jews, get in the corner here, okay, you guys are like the special saints, and then the Gentiles, okay, over here, and then the people that are seeking over here, and segment them and separate them and say, I have a different message for every one of you. So Jews, you're rocking it because you're Jews. And Gentiles, okay, we'll let you in, but you guys don't really get along, but we'll tolerate you. And then the rest of you, well, we'll talk about you until you figure it out, and then we'll talk to you. That's not how the church life was, and that's not how our church life should be either. They are all qualified to be inheriting the kingdom of God as we are. And, and again, like when you look at our culture today, and we think of what's happening in the United States, and the, the reality of all the different um, nationalities of people coming here, I think it's amazing. I grew up in a class where I was a visible minority. Believe it or not, I was the visible minority. There was six Caucasian guys in my class. I grew up with mostly Korean friends, Nigerian friends, Jamaican friends, like you name it, the list goes on, Japanese friends. I never understood that there were big differences between us. They were just my friends. Never really thought about it. So when you start to learn and grow up and realize that there's like uh, perceived differences in people, it's shocking for somebody who's never learned that because that has to be a learned behavior. That's not God's plan. So as we're looking at this church, we realize that Paul's addressing everyone in the church, that they have the inheritance in Christ and they are saints in light. Jews and Gentiles can both inherit the kingdom of God and are considered saints. And of course, we know the history of Paul. We know that Paul was an amazing conversion. And Paul would have been, as Pastor Jeff mentioned last week, he would have been the one to have your relatives murdered if he was here right now. He would have been the one to commission their murder. And it would have been justified by the law. Now he's preaching to them forgiveness. The strange irony that, that we get to read. And that is the amazing, redemptive grace of God in our lives. So when we look at others and think, oh, I'm not as bad as them. Oh, yes, you are. <laughs> um, number two, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. That's a big statement because he's talking about heaven and hell. He's talking about the universe and beyond. We look at the stars and think we'll never achieve getting there. But we will outlive the stars if we're in Christ. So there's encouragement, but there's also the bigness of God that he's trying to get across. So how big is God to us? Do we trust him fully? If we can trust that the earth's rotation and the distance from the sun will keep us from burning up. Sometimes I'm very practical and I think like that. I think what could have created this circumstance that perfectly adjusted the universe so that I could be breathing right now. It, it just amazes me. And then thirdly, in verse 14, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So Paul reassures them with the promise that they need to rest in where their identity truly lies. So where is their identity? Is it in Christ? He believes so, but they need encouragement. So he prays where their salvation comes from. They need to understand the salvation. So they need a herald to go back with the letter to say, I am praying for you. And by the way, here's my prayer. I want you to know what I prayed, even though I'm not there. Because you may never, ever meet me. 
So you need to know how much I love and care for you. And he did that for people he never met. How much more can we do that when we're in this room together? God the Father qualified them for it. And it wasn't due to anything they've done. He's very clear that it's all of God and none of us. This is our greatest joy. And this should motivate us constantly to our knees in thanksgiving and for God's faithfulness to us. So as we close, because we're, we're getting close in time, uh, what can we learn from Paul's prayer? So how do we make this practical? Okay, I've told you a bunch of information. You've heard what Paul's prayed. And of course, Paul being very intelligent and very articulate and very detailed, um, I would love to get this letter. I would love to know that somebody f- sat down and thought of me and wanted to be so specific to love and care for me and want my soul to know Jesus Christ so we can learn. But here it is. Prayer is the biggest act of love anyone can offer. And it's also, unfortunately, the least practiced. It's the biggest act of love, yet the least practiced. And that's not meant to be a rebuke. Well, maybe it is it's a rebuke for myself. But it's meant to be an encouragement because you know the truth. You know how to apply it to your life. You know where the power comes from. And you have a life to live so you can live it out. So if you're breathing right now, you can be encouraged with this because you have a chance to act. We can intercede on behalf of others, much in the same way Paul does for the Colossian church and demonstrates that power. It's easy to make prayer the final thing we do. Let's, Let's be honest. It's the final thing we do when things finally just don't work. That's how it is in my life sometimes. I can go and go and go and think and think and do and do. And then Carrie will say, did you pray? I'll be like, uh, you know, and and I know right away the answer. Because we want to sound like we've got that together, but oftentimes we don't. It's so easy to make prayer the final thing. And then we need to reverse that. So I'm going to pray first. Even if I'm not seeking something out, God, pray that you'll open my eyes to what the next thing is. Maybe you're stuck. Maybe you're just, I don't know what God wants me to do. I'm young. I'm, you know, got life ahead of me. I'm trying to figure out what life is. Do you start strategizing or do you start praying? I think the prayer can feed the strategizing. And I think seeking others and getting encouragement. Paul reaching out to the Colossians is us reaching out to each other. So God never promised that we, we would get everything we want. I'm just going to be honest there. He didn't promise us comfort, a painless existence. Um, all we have to do is ask for testimony time, and you'll figure that out. There's a lot of pain in this building even. Um, so he didn't promise us a painless existence or victory over all of our sins. Um, we don't, we're not going to have a world free of darkness until the Lord returns. God is in control of that, not us. God did say that we can have joy, though, because he overcame the world. That God has the victory. That we don't have to worry about it. We don't have to have it all figured out. If we commit to growing in the knowledge of Christ. He, and walk in the manner that he described. God can do great things in and through us. And one specific prayer as we close. is It stood out to me. Um, and when you're going through a crisis. You, you seek out scripture verses. And this was one that stood out to me. It's Luke 22, 39 to 46. And it's Jesus himself praying and in the context um, if, if you think about this part of the passage here he's dealing with a plot to kill him betrayal saying farewell to those he loves bickering friends the disciples they wanted to know who the, the greatest was at the same time he's dealing with everything else and and this is what he's dealing with as he enters into his prayer and this is Jesus and it says and he came out and went as was his custom so this means he was he often prayed this is Jesus Um, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. In other words, pay attention. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Again, this is Jesus praying to the Father. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. 
And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like, like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. So they were not practicing it, yet he was exampling exactly what Paul described. He had the power from God. Now, he was strengthened by angels, but he, he sought power from God. So he humbled himself to example for us what our prayers need to be. And Jesus is God. Could he not have manipulated his circumstances? That's not the will of God. The Trinity, God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, are in relationship together. And this is an ongoing communicating relationship. Uh, he also examples for us the humility um, that's needed to honestly pray for others, especially those that drive you crazy. It takes humility to do that, but it's really hard to hate somebody that you pray for. So that's just a sideline challenge for you. If somebody is driving you nuts, pray often for them, and it will help. Um, he also shares the well-known desire to not want to deal with hardship. So he shares a humanity part of who he is in saying, please take this cup. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours. So I think that's important to note in that prayer. He submitted to God the Father ultimately and is more resolved to deal with the coming trials. So Jesus reset himself before he went to the next step, knowing he was going to be killed and ultimately raised from the dead. But he still prepared himself for the trials in the same way I think it's our encouragement for us that if we're a praying people, trials are just trials. We can't be overcome by trials. We can be overcome by the, the love of God. And that's the only thing that I'd ever want to be overcome by is the, the pursuing love of Christ. So, of course, um, there's other prayers in, in Scripture. I could walk you through tons of them. The Lord's Prayer. What does it say? Your will be done. How often I said that in, in elementary school when we're allowed to say the Lord's Prayer in school, which is dating myself a bit. But I didn't, I didn't even pay attention to this, but I said this every day from grades, kindergarten through grade six in my public school. So we can train ourselves to trust God over ourselves. So if we're pursuing Jesus with our hearts, we should be, if we're strong believers in the Lord, refined, sifted, shaken, challenged, and encouraged. And don't be afraid of any of it. That's my encouragement to you. And I pray that those who are dealing with difficult circumstances, and I can tell, I see faces in this room, and I know your circumstances, we can trust in the Lord. And I'm going to leave you with Ecclesiastes 7.14. In the day of prosperity, be joyful. And in the day of adversity, consider. God has made the one as well as the other so that man may not find out anything that will be after him. It's not our job to figure out the future. It's our job to trust God for that. We need to just figure out how to be right with him. And he does the work, not us. So let's commit to prayer. Let's understand humility a little more. Maybe be a little bit more convicted, all of us, in what's going on in our lives. Maybe be a little bit more honest with ourselves. Maybe be a little bit more patient. Long-suffering, as it were. And trust that God will handle the outcome. Because Christ has overcome even death on our behalf. What an amazing thing. That's why I love Easter. We get to say that he died, yet he rose again victoriously. So we have life because he gave us life. And we're going to close in the song, Death Was Arrested, um, because I want to end rejoicing in that fact. So let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your love for us. I thank you for Paul's prayer to the Colossian church. I thank you for its challenge. I thank you for your word. Because we need to marry all of this together. We need to take knowledge and wisdom, so knowledge applied, and action. And our faith is dead without action. Yet our action requires faith. 
And there is a tension in our world to want to focus on self. I deserve it. I deserve to be first, not second. And how often are we willing to set our own agenda aside to help somebody else, to take a few hours out of our day, a few moments out of our day to just pray? Lord, I pray that this has been encouraging to have even an example of prayer in Scripture that we can look to as a model, even with the Lord Jesus Christ himself in praying to his Father as an example for us to communicate with our, our Heavenly Father. Because of Jesus and by your Spirit, I pray for a renewed focus in prayer and that you would encourage us and spur us on and challenge us and use others around us to challenge us to want to trust in you more. So Lord, as we close in singing, may we be reminded of this as we go throughout our week. In your name, amen. All right, let's stand together and we'll sing.
Hebrews 13, 20 to 21. This is our benediction. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen? All right, you are dismissed. Have a great afternoon.